There is no art which one government sooner learns of another than that of draining money from the pockets of the people. Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. Hello there, welcome back. I'm sure that you missed me as much as I missed you. The Knight of the Green Coat is confused but also impressed. On one hand, he finds this difficult to believe. How can it be that there are knights errant in the world today and printed histories of true knightly deeds? On the other hand, he shares Don Quixote's desire to assist widows, damsels, married women, and orphans. The Knight of the Green Coat's final words of praise hint at Cervantes' idea of writing a more noble and moral type of chivalric fiction which might overcome the more violent and sexual aspects of chivalric fantasy. This voices perfectly the perspective maintained by Erasmus and his student Juan Luis Vives, both of whom were very much out of favor in Spain during the Counter-Reformation. With that history that your grace says has been printed about your noble and true deeds, countless stories will have been forgotten about those imaginary knights errant who have so filled the world doing such damage to proper customs and causing such detriment and discredit to good histories. Did you know humanists like Erasmus and Juan Luis Vives had already criticized the novels of chivalry in the early years of the 16th century? Thus, Cervantes is by no means the first detractor of the literary genre. Of course, Don Quixote objects, but the man in green responds with incredulity. Well, is there anyone who doesn't doubt that such histories are not false? Note, however, that Don Quixote remains civil. I hope God permits me to convince your grace that you have erred in accepting the popular opinion of those who are certain that they are not true. The other knight now knows Don Quixote is insane. Nevertheless, he invites his guests to his house to dine with him and then introduces himself in great detail. He is also an Hidalgo, although far wealthier than Don Quixote. His name is Don Diego de Miranda. He leads a modest life. He has a family, hunts and fishes, and boasts that he has a library of around six dozen books. These are in Spanish and Latin. Some are histories and others devotional books. Note a crucial difference between the books in his library and those in that of Don Quixote. Those of chivalry have yet to cross my threshold. What distinguishes the Knight of the Green Coat from the Knight of the Sorrowful Face? A, his sexual orientation and his diet. B, his maternal language and his political loyalty. C, his literary preferences and his economic status. Correct answer, C, his literary preferences and his economic status. To repeat, Miranda appears to be a particular kind of reformed Catholic, Erasmian in nature. He is not interested in judging the private morality of others, and he avoids public displays of his religion. I do not examine the lives of others, nor am I a lynx regarding the acts of others. I hear mass every day. I give alms to the poor without boasting of my good works so as not to allow vanity and hypocrisy to enter into my heart. His piety is simple, elegant. I am devoted to Our Lady, and I trust always in the infinite mercy of the Lord our God. Sancho's response to all of this is fascinating. He leaps from his gray and kisses Miranda's feet. Your grace strikes me as the first saint with short stirrups that I have seen in all the days of my life. Miranda denies being a saint, but Sancho's gesture manages to bring Don Quixote out of his melancholy state. Next, we learn that Miranda's son has been studying Latin and Greek at the University of Salamanca, as well as lyric poetry. Miranda admits to being disturbed by his son's interest in classical literature. He would have preferred that he study law or theology. By contrast, his son is now participating in a literary joust, in other words, a poetry competition. There is something deeply autobiographical about this passage, as if Cervantes were projecting his own life onto that of Miranda's son. And it is Don Quixote who defends the son's interests, counseling that parents should be loving and patient with their children. Regarding forcing them to study this or that science, I do not think it is wise. A child should be allowed to follow his passions. It would be my opinion that they should let him pursue that science toward which they see he is most inclined. 
He then offers an allegory for poetry, which at that time included all forms of creative literature, comparing it to a tender young damsel, which the other sciences should enrich with their knowledge. He also allows that poetry has the power to create a kind of metaphorical gold. She is made according to an alchemy that is of such virtue that he who knows how to treat her will turn her into the purest gold of inestimable value. Given the issue of writing for money in both parts of Don Quixote, perhaps this gold is more than just a metaphor. Like Cervantes, Don Quixote also objects to writing according to tastes of the vulgar man, but note how he defines this vulgar man in a democratic sense. Even kings and dukes can be commoners. Anyone who is ignorant, even if he be a lord or a prince, can and should be counted among the masses. Finally, in Don Quixote's discourse, we hear Cervantes making a vigorous defense of modern writers of poetry in Romance, or modern Spanish. Modern writers should be just like Homer and Virgil, who wrote in the maternal tongues. All the ancient poets wrote in the language of the milk of their mothers, and they did not go seeking foreign languages in which to declare the nobility of their ideas. Then again, he tells Miranda to be open-minded about his son's interests that your grace should allow your son to travel wherever his star should lead him. Perhaps revealing Cervantes' vision of his own art, Don Quixote quotes directly from Ovid, the great Latin author of the Metamorphoses. Est Deus in nobis, meaning God inhabits us, alluding to the divine and prophetic function of creative writing. He also cites Horace, who even deployed lyric poetry to write sophisticated social satires. If he should compose sermons in the mode of Horace, in which general vices are so elegantly reprimanded, then praise him, because it is licit for the poet to write against envy. Finally, referring to Ovid's exile, Don Quixote notes that creative writing can be political and thus dangerous for the writer. There are poets who, for the sake of saying something malicious, will run the risk of being exiled to the islands of Pontus. Now, at this precise point, there is suddenly a royal presence. Raising up his head, Don Quixote saw that down the road on which they were traveling, there came a wagon bearing royal banners. In other words, Don Quixote's discourse on creative writing dovetails with the subsequent adventure, and we must assume that it will be political and satirical. That's all for now. Please tune in and watch our next video. Don't miss out on the adventures of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote de la Mancha. To enroll in the course, click on the novel. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on Don Quixote. To watch more videos, click on Dulcinea. And to follow us on our social media, Click on Sancho Pan.